that is the focus of my lecture. I will be overviewing the rise of China as the topic implies. We will be going through some facts and figures and we will be discussing the consequences of this for mostly for the EU, but also uh, other countries that are related uh, to, to this relationship some way. You know, um, so at some point we will be, you know, uh, mentioning countries like US into the picture as well. And time permitting, I will be answering um, your questions if you have any at the end of my lecture. So let's go through some facts uh, for those people um, that I don't, it's like, I hope you can see the pictures here. So what do we know about China? You know, very few fast, uh, you know, facts. Uh, it is, it, it has about one fifth of the human population. It is currently the most crowded country on earth. Um, and uh, they're growing, they have grown for on an average of about 10% per year for almost four decades. That's a long time. And as a result, uh, they are now a very important global actor when it comes to manufacturing, when it comes to cutting edge technology, we will be discussing this. And uh, it is ranking as number two in the world. So the first, uh, the highest ranking country in the world when it comes to economy is USA. Uh, back in the old days, in the 80s, 90s, uh, Japan used to be number two, but nowadays it is um, China, followed by Japan as number three, okay? So, um, and um, as far as um, urbanization, again, um, China is rapidly urbanizing. There are at least six mega cities. What do we mean by mega cities? Those are um, cities with at least 10 million people and counting population. So those are big cities. Okay, and um, there are at least six mega cities, and this number is expanding as we speak. Okay, and going back to the economic growth, the first quarter growth of China was in, in back in 2019 was 6.4 per you know percent, which is uh, which is rather remarkable when you think that they were already involved in a trade war uh, with USA at the time, and this is still uh, double uh, the uh, UN forecast. Uh, of growth uh, that is estimated for the rest of the world. So um, this is this is pretty remarkable, I would say. Um, let me see. Oops, it doesn't move. Hold on. Yes. So um, what do we know about? Um, so let's look at the leading. Um, I can't see this very well. Hold on. Uh, let's see if I can see this. So leading car, car vehicle brands in China 2017 by volume of sales. So again, I'm giving you some statistics about China. Their relevance will become clearer to us later on. The leading um, brand here, as we can see, is Volkswagen, a German um, car brand, followed by Honda, which is a Japanese brand followed by a Chinese, I believe, uh, brand by Sealy, and then Buick, an American company, Toyota, Japanese company, Nissan, French, uh, Japanese um, company, as far as I know. And um, the thing about these, as we will see, is that um, this is an important, um, let's say, market. And as we can see, European um, countries or uh, Western countries, uh, the countries that are associated with the West uh, take the lead in these sales, okay? So keep that in mind because it will become uh, relevant to our discussions later on in, uh, in our um, presentation. So again, Chinese tourists are spending more and more money abroad. Why? Because as the country is getting richer and richer, uh, this means that they have more purchasing capabilities. And this also means more Chinese tourists abroad, uh, which means income for other countries, intercultural exchange, so far and so forth. So um, another thing we need to find out about the China is the our research and uh, development expenditure. So this is important because um, as a country, you can sell pretty much anything you want. But if you really want to get rich, it's better to sell high value, what we call as high value added goods. And for th this is why China has been investing a lot in its research, uh, you know, spending a lot of money on its research and development. And as what is remarkable here in this picture is that China has closed the gap, it seems, uh, in R&D expenditure. This is a figure from 2017. Here we can see the United States with this yellow um, line, okay? And this is red, China. It has taken over 
um, Europe, EU, um, somewhere around uh, 2000, maybe 14. So this is 2015. This is earlier than 2015. And it's counting and it's, it's, it's reaching almost the level of United States, as you can see. And Japan, um, economy number three is, is really a lot uh, lower in, in, in terms of, of, of the numbers that we can see here. Uh, so this also shows you how remarkable the research and development expenditure in China has become. And of course, this is going to have implications for its um, relations uh, with other countries and uh, its future behavior. So, um, and uh, this is the patents that uh, Chinese uh, have uh, received in 2017 again. So this is 1,300,000 almost uh, patent applications in China led by about what is it like, um, you know, 300,000 patent applications in, you know, from in, in the US, uh, followed by a nearly same number from Japan uh, and Germany, you know, Europe, uh, you know, it's like uh, is um, less than, I would say this is 100,000. So it's about 50,000 or so from Germany, patent applications. Uh, and uh, for Russian Federation, for those people uh, who are uh, joining us from Russia, uh, yours is um, lower. I don't know the exact figure, but it's lower. So, um, so this, is, this also shows us the remarkable, um, you know, uh, speed and uh, ferocity that China has put into research and development in recent years. So it's, it's pretty huge, the gap. Um, so having stated, you know, given you all these, I'm giving you a laundry list of all these statistics, you know, I always ask my question, you know, my students in classroom, so what? I mean, all of these statistics I've been throwing at you, so what? Well, these are important because um, when we consider um, when when we consider a country's um, development as a threat or an opportunity, we're going to use these figures. We're going to see what we what we view, okay, and what other people think, okay. And here um, there are, I would say, two camps. I mean, I'm I'm very I'm caricaturizing this whole uh, perspective, but if we could you know boil it down, we could say that there are two camps when it comes to China's rise, you know, the, the, how they view China's rise. The first camp considers this to be an opportunity. It's great news. The second camp thinks, you know, is, is rather pessimistic and they think that sooner or later this is going to become a threat and it's going to cause problems for everyone. Well, let's go over that. You know, let's go over the opportunity camp first. Why is China's rise, you know, an opportunity? First of all, in this camp, uh, you know, the, the, the first proponents, they think that um, China has become a global economic dynamo. So what does that mean? It means that China's economic development has an overall positive implication on the world economy. So when Chinese people, um, you know, um, have more money, they can also um, in, make more investments abroad. So this means that they can buy uh, more um, stuff, let's say, in terms of raw materials from, let's say, Australian mines, or they, you know, and, and if you're a Chinese, you know, middle class uh, family, you can buy a German car, or you can buy more soybeans from the US. Okay, so that's good news for not just for China, but for everyone. And, um, and this, they also consider that because of China's adoption of liberal markets um, some decades ago, uh, they have been able to manage tenfold growth in three decades. So that's very remarkable. They think that this is a success story and they think that China should be an example for the rest of the world. And it, you know, it should be a positive example. Uh, other developing countries can follow up on its example and uh, to develop themselves and to co cooperate with China. So um, one thing, however, China will have to mind, uh, also the proponents of this approach say, is that it will need to avoid the middle income trap. So what is the middle income trap? This is an economic term. I'm not an economist, so I don't know how to, to put it in technical terms, but you know, to put it very, I would say simply, this is a condition where when a country reaches a certain income level, then it gets stuck there. It can't move any further. Why? Because when you reach that certain level, your wages have increased somewhat 
And um, therefore, um, you can, you know, you're, 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 you're not making as much profit as you used to do. One way to make more profit is to produce more value added products, but value added products means a lot of research and development, which is not going to be available right away. It is very, uh, it is very capital intensive. You will have to spend a lot of money on it before seeing results. So as a result, um, a lot of people, I'm sorry, a lot of countries get stuck in the middle income trap. And, um, and the proponents of this theory say that, you know, um, China will do great as long as it can avoid this middle income trap. Um, as we have seen in the research and development slide earlier, um, China so far has, this is one of the reasons why China has been investing aggressively on uh, research activities, spending a lot of money on it, okay? Um, the second one, the second proponents, I would say the second group of proponents for China's rise say that this is good news because China, if it, you know, when it rises, it will become the keeper of the status quo of the existing world affairs. They're not gonna, you know, they, they because one thing that China would hate to do the proponents of this argument would say is to to threaten any, you know to to do anything that would threaten its development. So um, China, therefore, and the Western world would have you know converging interests, not diverging interests. They they the both parties want stability in the Middle East. They all are against religious radicalism or radicalism of all sorts, and they all uh, want to control nuclear proliferation. And therefore, China, according to this group of arguments, it's an important actor for global peace and stability. It will make sure that nothing um, unexpected or cataclysmic will happen in world politics or society in the years to come. Um, and an extension of this argument has to do with China being the guardian of multipolarity. So um, as we all know, during the Cold War, the world was bipolar. There was the Soviet Union and the USA, and then um, Soviet Union um, dissolved. And uh, for a while, USA was left uh, as, as a unipolar power. Uh, but then um, in recent years, we have seen the rise of BRICS. So which countries are these? Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. So um, these countries important, uh, are important according to the proponents of this argument because they balance um, uh, you know, uh, United States or any other actors uh, that are on the world stage. And this is why, you know, be because of their presence, uh, any kind of hegemonic over domination in world politics could be avoided. And uh, they would think that China uh, would be interested in increased checks and balances. And uh, they, China would be a power that would um, collaborate with the rest of these countries on issues like terrorism, energy, or climate change. And the fourth argument in this proponents of China group, I would say, China's rise group, is that they claim that um, it's better to support China's rise because if China is weak and poor, it's going to cause more problems for the world. So the first person who came up with this idea on the world stage was the former US President Bill Clinton. Okay, um, and um, so what China really, you know, what, what, what all countries and China itself should look for in the, in the future is to make sure that, um, you know, the increased wages would not uh, decrease the competitive edge of China, you know, to make sure that it wouldn't fall into the middle, middle, middle income trap, as I've just explained. And um, because this uh, could lead to social unrest for over a billion people. I mean, imagine, uh, you know, over a billion people, um, you know, uh, getting into, uh, you know, all kinds of um, just social unrest and, and just, uh, you know, riotous activities. This is, this is neither good news for those people, nor for the neighbors, nor for the region, nor for the rest of the world. And this is why uh, the proponents of this approach would say that weak China is not a good idea. We should always support China's rise because doing so is going to bring stability for the world. Okay. So um, let's go over to the opposition camp, the, the, the bunch of you know, uh, opponents who think that China's rise sooner or later is gonna cause problems, create problems for the world. So one, um, you know, the first one that, you know, the first uh, set of arguments here is starts with the rapid militarization um, trends in China. So Chinese military budget has increased over 12% uh, over a decade. 
So that's, you know, that's a lot, okay? And, um, and they currently have more than 2 million soldiers, you know, which is pretty big. And, um, and more importantly, China has had um, conflicts uh, or it has had, um, it has had um, let's say, uh, non-harmonious relations um, on issues like Taiwan, South China Sea, and it has had territorial skirmishes with India. So uh, this gives room for thought for people uh, about China's uh, future intentions and activities. Okay. Um, so let's, you know, this is, uh, this is uh, from, uh, sorry, this is from uh, CIPRI, um, an organization in Sweden, uh, which follows up on countries' expenditures. So as we can see, uh, China's uh, military spending, even though it is, it has decreased a little bit, um, it is still pretty, uh, it is still pretty uh, big um, compared to um, other countries out there. So the, the yellow uh, you know, uh, line here represents Russia, the blue line is US and China, even though it's nowhere near um, US yet, it's, it's, it's really, uh, it has shown a steady rise. And uh, again, um, these are uh, the announced uh, official Chinese defense budget over the CIPRI estimates. As you can see, they're constantly larger. Uh, why is there such a discrepancy between these figures? Well, because these are considered as um, security issues and therefore they're considered as sensitive, not only China, but no country in the world is going to give you exact uh, figures about their uh, exact defense spending. Um, it's just, um, it's, I guess it's just not done um, um, on a regular basis. A second, pro you know, opponents of, uh, you know, set of opponents for the rise of China uh, claim that China is a ruthless player. Um, in, in economics, especially because um, China's cheap labor, because of the sheer human potential, I mean, imagine you have lots of people there, obviously, it has caused fierce competition with the rest of the world to sell their goods. And this has, uh, according to the proponents of this argument, it has led to the global loss of jobs, uh, which is uh, bad news, obviously. And secondly, um, you know, while they're developing all of these things, China has also apparently has not paid much um, importance to intellectual property rights. Okay, so it ranks as uh, 52, uh, the 52nd country uh, when it comes to pro you know, protecting property rights. Uh, and the first one, I guess, is New Zealand, so good for them. But uh, China, compared to its size, uh, this, is, uh, this is pretty low. And this is a problem. Uh, this has been criticized by other countries because at the end of the day, um, the, you know, paying uh, little attention to intellectual property rights or not being um, careful about it can hurt both producers and consumers at the end, okay? And um, China's rapid development also means that it's consuming more and more energy. Uh, again, uh, which means that both China needs more energy resources, which it has to compete with the rest of uh, the world uh, to get, uh, because China is not a resource-rich country when it comes to uh, uh, when, when when it comes to energy. Okay, and um, and it also means uh, the, uh, the 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 all kinds of uh, carbon emissions for the world. So this doesn't only have implications for China, but it also has implications for everyone else, you know, us. So here, as you can see, uh, starting from 1998, China has steadily increased its carbon uh, greenhouse uh, gas production. And at some point, it has uh, surpassed, um, surpassed uh, US and Europe combined. So it is the most polluting um, country right now, um, or at least it's more polluting than US and Europe combined uh, when it comes to uh, the emission of greenhouse gases. So this is, uh, this is something that needs to be dealt with both by China as well as for, you know, for, for, for everyone, for all mankind, if you will. And uh, dramatically, as you can see, since 2000, Chinese carbon uh, emissions have increased by 171%, so which is you know pretty vast when you think about it. So um, another thing has to do uh, with you know with the opponents of China's rise has to do with their uh, approach when it comes to foreign aid. They claim that uh, the way China has dealt with foreign aid has led to dependency issues in certain 
uh, parts of the world, especially Africa. So um, China has developed some pretty close ties with a lot of African countries in the past. Um, and therefore, um, they say, you know, so the opponents of uh, this trend argue that um, Chinese investments mostly um, benefits them, but not uh, the, the countries that receive those investments. And, uh, but more importantly, I would say this is not a trend that is only endemic to Africa. China recently has also uh, been um, accused of, um, of, of controlling um, certain um, investments in Europe as well. So there were a couple of years ago, a power company takeover attempt in Portugal. Um, they have purchased uh, ports like the Piraeus port, for instance, in Greece. And they have attempted technolo technology transfers uh, from countries like the Netherlands, which has, uh, which has uh, been criticized by the West uh, for being aggressive and, uh, and, and not having a good uh, turn for uh, the countries that are involved with China. So um, as you can see, the Chinese global investment has steadily risen since 2005. And this is the, uh, this is the, um, uh, the graph for the graphic for the loans to African governments from 2000 to 2016. As you can see, it's the rise is pretty dramatic. I'm whisking over these um, graphs, but in the Q&A session, if you want me to go back to it, I could gladly do that. Uh, there's a lot of things that I want to discuss with you. This is why I'm not spending a lot of time over these graphs, but if anyone wants to go over them in more detail, we can do that in the Q&A session. All right. So again, um, the rise of China, as I said, this is not only a deal for one region. So it's not like only the worry of Africans or it's not, you know, uh, the Americans, which, you know, Chinese uh, also hold a lot of the American debt. As, as I said, they hold over a, a trillion dollar of American U.S. debt, which is, you know, as you can imagine, a lot of money. But it's not only, you know, uh, you know, Africa or it's not only United States or it's not only the Balkans or Portugal, uh, but, um, it, you know, China has pretty much uh, made investments or has sent foreign aid to almost all parts of the world. And uh, some parts of uh, the, the foreign aid re recipients uh, for those people, you know, participants from Russian Federation today are uh, to those regions that were traditionally considered to fall under the Russian sphere of influence. Okay, uh, so this includes, you know, countries in Central Asia, Eastern Europe, and so forth. So, um, so what I would say is that uh, the implications of Chinese uh, foreign aid or Chinese investments are not only bilateral, they don't only have bilateral consequences. They also have global consequences because they're really widespread. They don't only involve a certain region or a certain country is all I'm trying to explain here, okay? And the fourth one, the rise of China, why it could be a threat. The proponents of this approach, they think that, um, you know, uh, the Chinese views on democracy, on human rights, on, um, on, on these issues are not the same as the US, EU or Western approach. OK, and um, they have uh, brought up uh, the issues that occurred in China in places like Hong Kong and Xinjiang in recent years to criticize the Chinese approach to this whole issue. And uh, they, they therefore claim that China is unreliable when it comes to um, when it comes to discussion of of um, of uh, promoting human rights or democracy on a global scale. Also, Chinese actions in UN has been criticized for uh, for either for providing support uh, to those countries with authoritarian leanings or those countries that are known to have human rights, have committed human rights violations in cases like Myanmar or Sudan or Syria. Okay. Um, so um, as we would say here, uh, most importantly, the Chinese actions um, in Africa and elsewhere, uh, what, you know, so what does it say to you? So, you know, the, all of these actions. So what is it to you about this? Well, the way China acts in those places, it really is a challenge to the EU, EU conditionality principles on human rights and foreign aid. OK, so, you know, the traditional EU approach to this is that they do give foreign aid to countries, but it's on the conditionality principle. They would expect those countries that are the recipients of aid to abide uh, by um, human rights, basic human rights, 
or uh, to try to democratize or to have a liberal market economy and so forth. Uh, China um, doesn't really uh, promote these things, but um, they are they consider these things to be the inter domestic affairs of the countries that they're dealing with. So they don't really discuss these things when they're negotiating the details of their foreign aid. And this has received criticism from the West. Okay, And this is why Chinese economic growth and Chinese foreign aid is considered uh, to, be a, to be a challenge to the EU aspirations to be this normative model for the world. So this is uh, the Pew Research Center's uh, 2018, um, 2018 um, results of, of, of a survey on the favorability of United States and China. So these are the countries, uh, you know, there are six countries here. As you can see, um, the, the Dutch people seem to have the most positive view of China. And um, from what I can see here, Italy has the least uh, favorable perspective when it comes uh, to China, which is rather interesting because as we will see further on, Italy was also <clears throat> the first country from the um, G7, uh, which you know, officially endorsed the Belt and Road Initiative of China. So I, don't, I, I guess we would have to look into this. Time permitting, actually, I would like to <clears throat> discuss with you um, that European countries have some very conflicting views on um, China and how they perceive China, whether they consider China to be an ally or, or a challenge. And, um, and the, these ideas also change from sector to sector. Okay, so they may consider China to be an ally, let's say when it comes to FDIs, foreign direct investments, but when it comes to energy sector, um, they may consider China to be uh, a challenge, you know, a challenger, if you will. Um, this is uh, from uh, I, a study that was recently conducted for um, East um, European, uh, a couple of East European states in the recent past. Okay, so now I'm switching on to um, the <clears throat> an article. I'm sorry, a chapter by Buchan Wong on the Chinese and EU views of military security. And um, so I'm going to be using them to um, in my in this part of my presentation, as they have claimed here, uh, Duke and Wong, uh, Chinese and views uh, EU views of military security. Um, they're not um, necessarily um, identical, and they have been subject to diverse interpretations. Traditionally speaking, EU's military security relations with China. Uh, was a subset of its concerns or its uh, overall engagement with East Asia. Okay, and the EU goal for many years was to prevent um, the tensions in Southeast Asia to in South China Sea from spilling onto uh, the Indian Ocean. As uh, as uh, I don't know if you can see this um, this picture very well, but this is South China Sea. And uh, this is the Indian Ocean, and these are the main uh, sea lines of communication. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a lot of trade, uh, you know, this is a very major trade route, global uh, trade route. And so uh, the security of these routes are considered to be important, not only for Asians, but uh, for, for Europeans and, and for pretty much everyone who are over here. So um, another thing that has brought up is that the Chinese EU military relations in Asia uh, would be dependent on EU um, Asia EU USA relations. Why? Because USA was an active player, has been an active player in Asia uh, since the end of, of the Second World War. It has allies. Uh, it has formed bilateral allies. It has uh, fleets uh, and, and, and base military bases. And therefore, uh, the EU's uh, military perspective of that region and its military perspective of China uh, is also informed by the US uh, position in that region. Okay. Um, so, but in recent years, as we can see, so this is the traditional way. Back in the old days, EU considered its military relations with China to be you know, pretty much confined to how things went on 
in, um, in Asia itself and the neighboring region like the Indian Ocean. Nowadays, this is changing and EU uh, is attempting to bring China in for military cooperation in other regions such as Africa. Why? Because um, EU and China are starting to realize that they have common objectives in those regions. Uh, they would like to work on reinforcing peace and security. They would like to work on peacekeeping operations in Africa. And uh, finally, they can also work on capacity building and training. And here, um, EU um, thinks that its um, experience um, in these um, fields can be informative to China and they can form a collaboration there. Um, so um, for many years, I would say that the military security in EU-China relations uh, did not go anywhere. This has to do with the ban of contacts uh, between both sides from the EU and the People's Liberation Army, Chinese Army, up until 1995. And this also has to do with the overall evolution of the CSDP. What is CSDP? It is a common security and defense policy. So in 1998, the CSDP was established, but it wasn't until 2003, the first military mission um, actually uh, was put into force. As a and, and until Lisbon Treaty in 2009, uh, the European uh, Commission did not have any legal capabilities to discuss military security subjects um, in, in its discussions with third parties. This is why it's normal uh, for uh, both sides uh, to not really dwell much on this, uh, you know, on this issue because there wasn't really um, much to talk about. So, um, and in the meantime, I have already just told you that Chinese uh, military um, expenses are dramatically increasing. Uh, why, you know, why all of a sudden our country starts spending a lot of money on its, um, you know, military? One of the reasons this goes back to actually the post Cold War era. Uh, and what China was exposed back then. Um, so basically, um, there were a lot of things happened there that alarmed the Chinese statesmen. So it's like the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the demise of Yugoslavia, uh, the fall of Berlin Wall, uh, you know, the end of communism, and of course, the Tiananmen incidents. Um, so they, they really uh, put uh, they really concerned uh, the Chinese leaders where they decided that they would security at the forefront of their concerns. And therefore you would see exponential increases in Chinese military budget ever since the end of the um, Cold War. And as I already mentioned, China has also had uh, problems in its region uh, with other countries, the neighboring countries, um, as well as external actors like the US. Okay, so, um, in the meantime, what's going on in the EU? At the end of the Cold War, there was the end of bipolarity, which also meant that uh, they could relax a bit because it was the end of militarism for them. And, uh, but on the other hand, uh, for EU, interstate conflicts uh, rose, as in the case of Yugoslavia. And uh, still, there were no explicit threats to EU and, uh, and economic concerns were more important. And this is why you uh, paid more attention to soft tools and uh, the, the, the concern for defense um, kind of decreased in those years, okay, after the Cold War uh, up until uh, 2010, 2012 for um, EU, okay? So, um, as I said, uh, within this framework, uh, a lot of the EU-China relations were based on economic cooperation. And military uh, security only became prominent in recent years, as I mentioned. Uh, there, both parties are interested in keeping the major maritime routes between ports safe. Okay, and uh, this is the sea lines of communications. And um, they, you know, EU wants to make sure that the sea lines of communications are open uh, according to the rule of law and uh, according to the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. Okay. So, um, as I said earlier, um, EU concentrated on these themes for many years because, as I said, um, uh, Europe, I'm sorry, European Union couldn't really discuss um, any uh, military issues up until um, the, uh, you know, up until recent years. Uh, they simply didn't have the legal capability. And even today, um, the, the, security, the security is first and foremost under uh, the, I would say, 
under uh, the sovereignty of each member state. Okay. Uh, so in the meantime, um, China in those years uh, began taking a strong interest in the EU's common security and defense policy. So here the China, you know, Chinese goals were to increase the military to military engagement and the cooperation of defense industries between EU and China. So the Chinese general motive, if I had to, you know, okay, you know, cut to the chase, let's summarize this. What would we learn from Chinese EU military relations? What does China want? The Chinese general motive, I would summarize in, you know, in those years is to promote multipolarity. So uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, EU acts as an independent actor, you know, EU acting as a pole independent, especially from uh, North Atlantic allies, uh, but mostly USA. Okay. So um, still um, in 2020, there is this um, EU strate China strategic agenda for cooperation that was established. So they, this, there is this, uh, there is this, I would say uh, desire to collaborate on peace and security. They're interested in uh, you know, mutual prosperity, sustainable development and people to people exchanges. But at the end of the day, the role of military security and mutual relations between EU and China remains rather ambiguous, okay? And um, this has to do a little bit also of China. I mean, this also has to do with stru structural restraints. Okay, one part of it has to do with structural constraints of EU. The fact that it's not a sovereign state; it's 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 a it's it's an it's, it's it's an organization. And security, you know, when it comes to security, each member state is responsible for its own security. Um, but it also has to do with um, each uh, you know side's perception of threat. And here, uh, I think uh, a very, you know, we need to discuss the Chinese uh, threat perception uh, very fast. So we would say that there are two contrasting themes there. On the one hand, you could say that China follows a realist approach when it comes to, you know, uh, conserving its territorial integrity and defense. And, uh, and they also want to use military power in order to enhance their great power status. So when, you know, it, they're quite realist when it comes to that. And this has been so um, ever since, you know, the establishment of the modern Chinese state, okay, since 1949. Um, and uh, to this end, they have been, as I said, involved in some wars, and they have also involved some skirmishes. So China has stick to this realist approach, uh, if, if, if it needed to do that. On the other hand, China also has this cooperative streak to it. So um, they have also accepted the five principles of peaceful co coexistence, as they say, which they adopted in the 1950s. What are those things? The mutual respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, mutual non-aggression, non-interference in each other's internal affairs, equality and mutual benefit, peaceful coexistence. Does this ring a bell, by the way, non-interference in each other's internal affairs? So when China was criticized, as I mentioned earlier, China was criticized for its actions or its behavior towards international crises like Myanmar or Syria or, or Sudan. They basically defended themselves by saying that they already hold on to this principle of non-interference in each other's internal affair. They consider these things to be that country's internal affair. And this is why uh, they refuse to get involved in it or make a statement on it or take part in, in that regard. Okay, and during uh, the Hu Jintao administration, uh, the, they mostly focused on peaceful development. This meant that they really didn't change or challenge the existing world order, the new liberal world order promoted by USA. So um, again, um, they do have some both sides when it comes to EU China military security issues. They do have disagreements based on historical, cultural, de geographical differences, but they, uh, there seems to be more room for cooperation than disagreements, especially when it comes to issues like sea lines of communication or taking humanitarian action, you know, humanitarian intervention in places like Africa. Okay, so um, let's see, I'm gonna, yes. Uh, so this is, uh, I, I said that China is becoming more active in um, international crisis, in international security related to UN. So um, since 1990s, 
Um, China has been active in, uh, has become active in over 20 uh, UN peacekeeping operations in different parts of the world, ranging from Lebanon to the Darfur region of Sudan. So um, again, um, when it comes to military security, so just like in foreign policy, China has this dual identity that uh, they have uh, kept within themselves. So um, on the one hand, they're a developing country. They're still a developing country, even though they're expending vast amounts of money on research and development, even though they are uh, doing very well for themselves when it comes to you know, um, economic development and purchasing power and whatnot. At the end of the day, there's, they still have a long way to go because of their sheer population and because of where they started from at the beginning. Um, and at the same time, they're also the descendants of, of a very ancient and, and, and at the, at the, you know, back in the, in the old days, a predominant um, civilization, okay? They call themselves the Middle Kingdom, literally, you know, Zhongguo. So this is, you know, this, this says something about their, for, you know, a self, uh, self-perception. So they have to juggle these two identities at the same time for themselves. So at this, you know, they have to do, do two things, which is kind of tricky for them. On the one hand, they have to reconstruct this Chinese identity as a cooperative power that is willing to cooperate with other countries in the world uh, for economic purposes, for social purposes, you name it, for development purposes. But at the same time, they also have to make a stand, they feel like they have to make a firm, you know, ground when it comes to maintaining their national pride and sovereignty. And here, they're not afraid to take hard military pop, you know, positions if, if the need arises. And here, um, you know, they, they always um, are reminded of what is called as China's century of humiliation. Um, you know, China really had, went through some very unfortunate, uh, disastrous set of events uh, during the past century. And this uh, caused a trauma uh, to the Chinese identity. And this also informed them about their future um, future actions with the rest of and future engagement with the rest of the world, as well as their self image, at least this is what uh, the constructivists uh, like uh, Amitabha Parcha, Acharya from international relations uh, theories tell us. Okay. So having stated that, um, so again, um, the EU focus uh, is on human rights on external, you know, which uh, affects their relations with external relations. EU wants to be the norm builder, uh, the norm leader, if you will, as opposed to China. China uh, considers development and stability to be a paramount concerns. They consider um, human rights and, and democratization and other rel relative issues uh, to be, uh, to be uh, the, the concerns of each state's internal affairs. And therefore they only consider development and stability to be the most important factors in their relations uh, with other um, countries, with the other regions. Um, so let's move on to um, the recent state of affairs with EU and China. So let's move outside the military zone because this is where things get really interesting. Um, it's not, as we have seen, um, what the real challenge uh, will look like in the years to come, apparently, is not going to be uh, the Chinese uh, military actions uh, for EU, uh, but, uh, but its challenges elsewhere. So um, according to, I'm, I'm here I'm using Bradberg and Lecour's um, article, the EU and China in 2020, more competition ahead. So here the authors argue that 2019 EU adopted a tough stance toward China, and uh, they predicted the future would be even more confrontational. And um, they think that uh, China and EU will have to reach on a bilateral investment agreement, but this is not going to be easy uh, due to their view, differing views on, um, on um, international um, competition, okay, the rules of competition, if you will. Also, um, the, uh, China's rapid rise in technology um, it has become a challenge for a lot of European governments. And now um, they have to make a decision on, um, on, on allowing China to uh, put down uh, the telecommunication networks in Europe, because this is no longer considered to be only a technical issue, but this is more and more regarded 
as a security issue. Okay, so here is the big dilemma. The EU currently wants cordial relations with China, obviously for economic reasons, but it also faces its challenges uh, due to their diverging uh, notions of cooperation. Okay, so this is something I took from uh, the European Union's fact she sheet. So in 2019, just to flesh, you know, what I've said so far further, in 2019, EU was China's biggest trading partner, and China was the EU's second largest trading partner. So, um, you know, whatever, you know, they, they really need to be careful uh, when they're dealing with each other, both sides, because they're major trade partners, um, let alone anything else. And um, so this, you know, which, you know, involves a lot of money, a lot of goods exchange, you name it. Okay. And what EU wants is that they want a comprehensive agreement on investment. And this is still going on, the negotiations. They, they haven't finalized this, but they want to have uh, more transparent rules, more egalitarian rules uh, for businesses on both ends, both for uh, EU member states as well as for Chinese businessmen. And they want more market opportunities for both sides. So um, there is protectionism and tariffs and other problems related to the Chinese side. Uh, one of the biggest complaints of the European firms is that they cannot have enough access to the Chinese market, which is obviously, as you can imagine, is gargantuan. So they really want to have access to it. And they think that they're not having as much access to it as China is having access to the European market. And they want uh, the rules to be more even handed for both sides. And they want, you know, European Union wants to encourage China to advance its economic reforms so that, you know, they can have this more even handed exchange between both parts. And they also want the market rules uh, to play a more decisive role. So in other words, no government interventions, which is going to be challenging for China, because as you know, it's a one party state. And uh, in its development story, it's, it's uh, glorious, I would say, development story, economic development, uh, the, state, uh, the state has led um, the decision making process. It's not the market, even though the, it is a market economy, state still takes the lead when it comes to making decisions about economics. Okay. So um, these are some of the figures for uh, what's going on uh, when it comes to Chinese foreign uh, direct investment outflows in 2000. 17, as you can see, they're steadily rising with taking a downturn in 2017, but that's an exception. So, and this is, these are the inflows to European Union uh, by, you know, it, and, and 28 countries by industry. So the light blue part is the transport, utilities and infrastructure. The dark blue part is the information, communications and technology. This part is the property and hospitality industrial followed by industrial machinery and other okay so as you can see it's, it's a steadily increasing inflow to european union and um, this is the country uh, level uh, i would say uh, picture of the of the same thing as we can say i can get back to it later if you ask any questions but i'm just going to move forward because i'm running out of time so again uh, this is the chinese global outward uh, foreign direct investment um, it took a peak in 2016. It uh, took then to, to and then it took a downturn in 2019. Uh, but still, it's uh, pretty large. Okay, so as I said that, uh, oops, uh, as I said that, um, the European views on China and its relations with China is somewhat uh, divided, and it's also controversial. Um, they're contradicting within themselves. One of the reasons for this is even though um, European Union does seem to realize that China is a huge market where they can sell their goods, there is plenty of room for cooperation in that regard. On the other hand, um, Chinese goods are getting more and more competitive when it comes to cutting edge it, it, technology. And also because of the market restrictions on the Chinese side, even though um, European Union had, has access to it, it's not as much as they like them. And this is why the Federation of German Industries, which is, uh, I would say the most, um, one of the most or the most influential uh, group uh, of, of of, of uh, trade, uh, trade, I would say, um, organizations in Germany. They had this policy paper um, recently where they described China as a systemic competitor. 
and they required that you know they gave the policy recommendation that EU needs uh, more um, more competition with China, and uh, the German businessmen claimed Chinese to be involved in harmful um, market distorting practices, and therefore they they decide you know they recommended the government in this case the German government to take a tougher stance on political measures. But then I would like to remind you that uh, remember that uh, slide that I showed you at the beginning of, um, of, of my presentation, which showed you the list of cars, the car sales in China. That's just one company and this one field, but this gives you an idea. If you're a policymaker, this is, this is no picnic. It's going to be difficult for you to really arrange this thing to occur, okay? To take a tough stance or to arrange it, uh, to, to do it in a way that's not going to hurt either side, if you will. And um, so this is why, um, you know, on the one hand, these uh, big companies, they don't want to uh, lose the Chinese market. But on the other hand, uh, they also see that more and more challenges are rising. So this is why um, the European Union is trying to come up with a more assertive strategy. And this is why the European Commission uh, president with the German chancellor and the French president, uh, they came up uh, with a paper, they published a paper in order to clarify the EU's approach toward China. And there, and I'm gonna quote from them, they're saying that China is a negotiating partner with whom the EU needs to find a balance of interests, an economic competitor in the pursuit of technological leadership and a systemic rival uh, promoting alternative models of a governance. So um, here, I think the use of terms are very interesting uh, because uh, these are some very straightforward uh, words um, that usually, you know, um, in the diplomatic language, as you know, people like, you know, uh, the diplomatic language usually sugarcoats everything to make sure that it's palatable and looks nice and everything. But here, there are some direct, um, you know, claims, uh, which is rather interesting because this is not the usual style of EU when it comes to dealing with China. Uh, why? Because uh, China, as I said, has been reluctant to open its markets to European companies and the EU is rather getting impatient at this point. And um, the trade war between China and USA has also affected uh, this, this whole trend, if you will, in the background, okay? So um, as, a, as a policy prescription, this published paper recently advocated for more flexibility and pragmatism when it comes to you know, dealing with both sides, uh, but they also uh, asked for greater European access to the Chinese market. Um, so, there is also the European Commission recommendations on 5G security concerns. So this is uh, the based on telecommunications. As I said, this is, you know, many of the European um, countries in the near future will have to decide a company to pick uh, to, for this um, infrastructure of, of their telecommunications. And telecommunications, as you can imagine, it's not just something that you call your friend to chat, but it can have uh, important widespread security implications. And um, some of the European countries have shown hesitancy uh, to, to award uh, this job, if you will, to Chinese companies, at least, or one Chinese company is, that's capable of doing this job, which is Huawei, okay? And it has caused um, some tension between both sides. As a result, the European Commission decided uh, to make some recommendations regarding this issue. So uh, they decided to run a national 5G security risk assessment for each member state. And then they would coordinate a European level assessment that would go, you know, almost like an umbrella um, uh, view on, on all those available um, risk assessments. And then um, later on, they would adopt a common approach to engage with explicit risks. Okay. And um, EU also did something that is um, I think here they took a page out of the United States. Um, so, and they, uh, they, have, they have decided to implement what they call investment screening implementation and tougher export controls in 2020. So, um, so here, uh, the investment screening, screening mechanism, what is it? Uh, the goal is to identify and raise awareness about Chinese foreign direct investment in critical assets in Europe. So what are those critical assets? What is considered to be a security concern? Mind you, this is not just military. Uh, this is this concerns, as I said, energy, ports and airports, 
communications, data, space, financial industries. So I think uh, this is, this gives a lot of room of thought for, for our powers, um, you know, network. So we were here, uh, have been discussing for over a year now that uh, security concerns of countries, of people are no longer just military concerns, but they're also concerns related to other subjects. And here you once again acknowledges this, and uh, there will be a lot of discussions related to this in the years to come. So um, who are the supporters of this uh, new um, screening implementation, if you will, uh, uh, practice? Uh, Germany, the Netherlands, the Baltics, and the Scandinavian countries have been um, among the uh, first and foremost proponents of this, okay? So um, what is the dilemma here? They want to do this because the EU's dilemma is as follows. If an EU member, let's say, I don't know, Luxembourg, let's say France, let's say Italy, uh, decides to uh, have an FDI, foreign direct investment, or a technology transfer, it can do it because it has the sovereign right to do so, right? It's security, its own concern. But the resulting implications of that action can affect the security of, the, of, of other members or the whole EU and they have to address this problem, okay? And uh, the question is, can they really do this? Because as we said, uh, EU did not have a comprehensive security framework in the past. They did take some um, steps, but it's not a sovereign state. So it's, it's kind of limited there. So here, this is why EU lags behind other international actors, uh, such as the US Foreign Investment Risk uh, Review Modernization Act. So this is, you know, I think uh, they were taking the framework from the US. Uh, this is precisely what the US Investment Risk Review Modernization involved, the so-called FIRMA. Uh, this was, effect this became effective in 2020. They want to protect uh, the big data at virtual in intelligence, I'm sorry, nanotechnology uh, and biotechnology and real estate transactions. And, um, and as a result, all of you know, uh, this um, Committee on foreign, for Foreign Investment in the United States would screen any trade deals where national secur security is considered uh, to be at risk. And what are those fields that are regard, you know, related to sensitive personal data, critical infrastructure, or critical technology? Um, but there are certain countries that are going to be exempt from it. So which are those? You know, what are those countries? They're Australia, Canada, and the UK. Why? Because they already share intelligence extensively among each other, and they also integrate um, their industries. I'm going to go through, I'm, I have little time left, and I want to, you know, uh, if you have any questions, I want to answer them. Uh, but uh, one thing I want to go over with you is that um, uh, two two things um, very fast. Uh, the there are um, you know um, the Chinese CEC annual forum that took place in 2019. It took it has been going on for a couple of years now. Um, so China has been uh, making a lot of attempts to uh, engage uh, Central and Eastern European countries as well as Balkan countries, and this is why they have been having annual forums. This has critic you know received some criticism from uh, some EU members, uh, some parts of EU, because they think that uh, they, this is regarding as a divisive uh, force on the part of China uh, to the unity of uh, the European Union. Another thing, I'm fast forwarding it, but I can go back to it if you like. Um, this is uh, the technology transfers. This is the, my final example before I stop. Um, so what happened is that there is this leading Dutch company called ASML, which produces, uh, you know, semiconductors, okay, and uh, chips. They're like little small. See this little um, grains? Those little grains? Those are salt grains, guys. And that little black dot there? That's that's a that's a chip. That's as little as it gets. So you know, this this also is pretty little, as you can see that that on that keyboard. So they're they're super little, and um, there are only a couple of countries in the world that are capable of producing them. And China wanted to have access to this technology. This, this is why they they put a bid on ASML to uh, to make sure that they would sell the Chinese uh, the technology that would enable them to do so. But very interestingly, this was in 2018. Um, uh, at first, uh, the Dutch company got permission from the the, the the Dutch state to do the sale. 
but then um, USA put pressure on the Netherlands to stop this deal because they they convinced uh, that uh, this would have a big technological breach that would also have security implications and um, USA succeeded actually um, you know the Netherlands uh, prevented um, uh, SML, a private company, from selling its technology to China. Why did they do this? Because they wanted to prevent China from receiving the technology that would allow them uh, to manufacture the fastest microprocessors in the world. So this is not only just good for cell phones, but this could also be used for all kinds of defense industry, military, you know, it has quite huge consequences, as you can imagine. So, um, what is the future on this? Um, it's up in the air. Um, EU has come up with certain uh, measures to ensure that the smaller, the uh, let's say uh, less powerful EU partner uh, member states would not be affected uh, by their rejection of Huawei or Chinese um, companies to enter or to do their um, their technological framework. Uh, but they're obviously scared of this backlash. And this is why um, European Union is trying to convince uh, those countries, as well as uh, the, you know, the, the countries with a member uh, candidacy status, like those in the Western Balkans, that they would have, you know, put more infrastructure investments in there and that they would support them in their measures so that uh, they wouldn't uh, have to deal uh, with any potential Chinese backlashes. And here, I would say that Germany's position um, regarding the issue will be decisive because of its sheer economic size. So I can go on and on and on, but I'm going to stop here.